No one could have predicted this confluence of events just a few months ago, beginning with the COVID-19 crisis, the ensuing economic crisis, then the death of George Floyd, and now the seismic street protests driving a sea change in public consciousness. CEOs across the corporate landscape have added their voices to the discussion and are determined to use their influence to make lasting change. Corporations are in a unique position and indeed are often expected to address issues of racial injustice and social unrest and other social issues that we face. For over 100 years, the Conference Board has helped the world's leading companies and society at large navigate crises and develop reasoned solutions for our country. We have, from our very earliest days, advocated for decent working conditions, for the rights of women entering the workplace, for the rights of people with disabilities in the workplace, and other challenges in creating a fair and respectful workplace for all. So given recent events, we're launching a series of CEO forums to foster action called Building a More Civil and Just Society, featuring CEOs and business leaders from across American industry who will focus on actionable insights to address our societal challenges. Today, we're fortunate to have George Barrett with us. George is the former chairman and chief executive officer of Cardinal Health, a role he held from 2009 through 2017, when he became executive chairman of the board, serving until November of 2018. Previously, George spent a decade at global pharmaceutical manufacturer, Tiba Pharmaceutical Industries, most recently as president and CEO. Over the years, he held various senior positions with other top pharmaceutical companies. Currently, he serves on the boards of Target Corporation, Olive, a healthcare-focused technology company, Instride, a, a public benefit corporation that provides workplace education, Nationwide Children's Hospital, and Children's Hospital's Solutions for Patient Safety. He's also the vice chairman of our board of trustees here at the conference board. But during his tenure at Cardinal Health, the company was recognized by Fortune as one of the world's most admired companies by Forbes as one of America's best employers, by the Wall Street Journal as part of Drucker Institute's top companies for corporate social responsibility, by the National Association for Female Executives in their Top Companies for Executive Women Award, and Chief Executive Magazine's Top Companies for Talent Development. We could not have a better guest uh, to join us for this particular <clears throat> topic. He earned his Bachelor's of Arts degree from Brown University and his Master of Business Administration from New York University. George, thank you for joining today. Thanks for having me, Rebecca. This is an important discussion, so I'm glad to be part of it. Well, thank you. Um, I, I'd love your views as a, as a CEO and also someone now who is so involved in, in different organizations at different levels. I know this topic comes up a great deal in many different contexts. I wondered if you could begin by sharing where you think we've come and, and where we, we still need to go in the world of diversity and equity and equality in the workplace? Uh, so I, I guess I, I would have to say um, we've made a lot of progress over the last decade, but uh, I think the data is also fairly clear at this point that we have not made the progress that we need to make. Um, and there are lots of different ways of measuring this. Um, if we just take the corporate world and let's say we look at the Fortune 500 as a measurement. Um, there are, I think today, fewer than 40 female CEOs among Fortune 500 companies, and fewer than uh, 10, and it might be fewer than five uh, black CEOs in that group. And so with all the attention that we've devoted to this, and it has been considerable um, for all of us, I would say that we haven't really made the progress that, that we still need to make. And, and as, you, as you look at the, the years where there has been a great deal of focus on it, certainly, um, what do you think are some of the perennial challenges that keep us from making the kind of progress that I think most everyone wants to see happen? Yeah, so um, it is a complicated story, as, as you well know. Um, some of this is broadly institutional. Um, you know, this, this question comes up, why aren't we making more progress? And I think we can probably acknowledge that we've made more progress with women uh, than, than we have with men. And I think if you look at, at management teams, you'd probably see, excuse me, with women than with, with, with black executives. Um, and I think you probably see this in management teams in the C-suite as well. But I think uh, there's been a lot of discussion about this, questions about whether or not it's in the pipeline. I don't really think that's the issue. I think it's really a combination of a number of factors um, that relate to opportunity and they relate to access. And I think if you look at the events of the past few months, um, which have highlighted some of the asymmetries 
in the way people are treated. Um, I think we can say that we all bring baggage. Um, even if we assume positive intent, um, we can still acknowledge that human beings probably have a tendency to see people, see in people like them, certain positive qualities, familiar qualities, and to assign to people who are unlike them, less favorable qualities. And I think there's a lot of data to support this. Um, Ken Frazier from Merck has talked about this issue a lot. He talks about the algorithm that we go through in our heads without even knowing it. And I think there is some uh, um, really validity to that. In fact, he talks about the fact that when they blinded the applicants for their intern pool, um, taking away name and pictures, that they saw very different results, a much higher percentage of, um, of black interns uh, selected. And again, this just highlights some of these dynamics. So that's, that's one piece, um, which is sort of this um, implicit bias that we, we, we all probably have as humans. I think the other, which has, again, been studied is this issue of access. Um, and again, I'll cite another company, LinkedIn has studied this. Um, and Jeff Wiener, who's, who, who's, this, has, who's the leader, of, has spoken about this issue, that we have a tendency to um, have certain groups of us that have benefited from the network effect, meaning we've grown up in the right place, we've been to the right schools, we've been employed in the right companies, and that that in and of itself creates sort of this virtuous cycle for those in the favored group, the group with access, and actually a blocker for those that don't have access. And so I think we have to think about all these things in terms of the work that we do uh, to address this. There are lots of other things which I think we'll touch on related to practices and policies, but I think you know, those are things that we probably have to acknowledge are with us and that we need to address. Well, I think there's something to that, and there's something to be said for, you know, casting a wide net and removing some of the things that if you select on a blind basis. Of course, it gets more tricky once you're starting to look at succession planning or opportunities when people are already your employees and you know them. And so part of what you know about them is sort of their background, and 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 so it's difficult to do it then. But I I wondered if, if before I start to ask some maybe questions about some of the things that you may have uh, led the initiatives on at Cardinal Health, because I, I think, as I mentioned before, you know, Cardinal Health has such a, um, a track record of having done some really uh, terrific things and, and having emerged as a, a company doing many of the right things in terms of advancing people's careers. How do you frame, as a CEO, how, how did you frame or think about the issue of diversity and inclusion? I mean, how, what was the the, the lens through which you looked at what needed to be done? This is a great question, uh, Rebecca, because I think the subject itself elicits strong responses and emotions from people. So I tried to frame this in the organization, um, really in the context of our business. And what I said was, I use multiple lenses in thinking about this, and I think people often do. Um, you can think of this from a moral and a fairness aspect. You can think of this in terms of the legal obligations that we have um, to, to have diversity in our organizations, certainly with government contracts. You can think of this as a, a market phenomenon, which is as an organization, wouldn't we want to, in a sense, represent the markets have, uh, that we serve and to look like the markets we serve? I think there was another aspect, um, which was the, the power of human capital, which is I want the most talent we could possibly get. And I know, that if everyone looks alike, sounds alike, thinks alike, the likelihood that we're going to get the, the kind of positive tension that's necessary for innovation is less likely. And so that I wanted an organization that actually had people that came from different backgrounds and different, different um, points of view and different worldviews. And that I thought that would make us stronger as an organization and actually be a competitive advantage. So I wanted to frame it using all of those lenses, all of which I believe in. George, we've done some work here at the conference board on the relationship between diversity and inclusion and higher levels of innovation. And, and I wondered if you had an example, uh, perhaps from Cardinal Health, where this focus on uh, d &I work uh, resulted in something that was an innovative uh, opportunity to kind of push the, the envelope. Yeah, um, it, it's actually a great question. And I, I, I'm reminded of a, of a, 
of an innovation that we saw in our pharmacy division. Um, so um, this was led, this idea by our, our women's uh, employee resource group, which is really a, a, a wonderful and powerful group at, at Cardinal. And we, they identified, this group identified that the overwhelming majority of, of graduates from pharmacy schools are women. I think it's over 60% now, somewhere between 60 and 70% of pharmacy graduates are women. And yet the number of pharmacy owners was actually very low. Uh, I think less than 15%, might've even been less than 10, but it was quite low. So their idea was, why don't we help these emerging pharmacists find opportunities to either acquire or build their own businesses, independent pharmacies that, that, that could run, um, you know, for us, a great customer base. And this idea um, literally coming from this resource group that might not have come from a group of guys sitting around and looking at strategies. And so again, this is just an example of having another lens, another point of view. And it turned out to be a, a wonderful idea and, um, and Carlo moved on it right away. George, you, you alluded to the, the network effect and how not being part of that keeps folks really at a disadvantage. I wondered if there was a, a way at Cardinal Health that perhaps you began to address that successfully. Yeah, this is a, a hard one, a hard nut to crack. But you know, th there are a couple of things that we did. I think the most effective thing that we did was to move from sort of the classic notion of mentoring, which is sort of counseling, to sponsorship. So the mentoring idea is more of a resource. I am a resource to you as your career unfolds. The sponsorship idea was to say, I have identified you, we have identified you as an organization, I am going to take ownership of trying to advocate and promote you in this organization to see your advancement. And I think that's an important distinction. And I think that is um, something that I, that I think we felt had some success. And I suspect that that's continuing today at, at Cardinal Health. So I, I'd be curious to know um, maybe some of your thoughts. You know, some of the literature will, will show that, you know, quite often um, men, uh, white men in particular are given opportunities that sort of position them for success in a way that those opportunities don't always come to others, whether those are women or underrepresented populations. And so therefore, when you're looking at a candidate fairly, uh, uh, fairly well into a career, you see a variety of experiences and you just think, well, this one's ready. And some of the data will show that women or minorities, for example, have to wait longer usually are older at the time that they are given certain opportunities, particularly at the CEO level, and, and that they are, they are held to a standard of having achieved as opposed to potential. So I, I'd be curious to know some of the things that you might have done at Cardinal Health that began to address some of those things so that the issues of fairness and opportunity um, really rose to, rose to the top. So let me describe a little bit about what we did. And let me also acknowledge that, that we've, we didn't accomplish everything I wanted to accomplish. Um, and like most organizations have a way to go. I would say that we started by making the notion of diversity and inclusion a business imperative, a strategic imperative. And so like any other critical strategy that requires planning, that requires uh, action items, that requires metrics, that requires reward systems that reinforce the things that you want to promote. And so I do think that this idea of integrating diversity and inclusion into your business, as opposed to thinking of it as a department, was important for us. Um, we did, um, as a, 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 another thing we did, we formed a, a diversity council. Now I chaired that diversity council, um, not the head of human resources, not our chief uh, diversity and inclusion officer. They were advisors to, to that group. And so again, signaling that this was a strategic imperative. Um, I would meet regularly with our employee resource groups. We had some very, um, just terrific and influential um, employee resource groups. And I would, I would sit with them and, um, and, and really get a chance to ask them what, what it was like to work at, at Cardinal Health. So again, we tried to treat this like any other strategy. Um, but again, this framing is very important, which is why is it important to us and what are we going to do to reinforce it? Um, we made tremendous progress along many metrics and particularly with women where 
Half of my direct reports were women, four of our board members were women. Um, you could look through our organization and see that progress. We, we actually had other areas where we were less successful. And it's probably some of these implicit issues that you referred to earlier that make it so challenging. We were underrepresented um, in our senior team with, with black employees. And I had that conversation many times with people in the organization. Um, good news, I know that my successor, Mike Kaufman, um, has continued uh, the seriousness around this, and I, and I can see those, the, those signs of progress there. So, um, you know, as it is one thing to say you're going to care about it and work on it. Making it happen is, it requires discipline and um, constant reinforcement. And going back to where I started, acknowledging some of these challenging things that are very tough for organizations, which is that we have some human characteristics that we have to fight and create mechanisms to overcome. Well, George, I don't think any company you know, achieves all that they want to do in this space. But the question is, you know, how, how much progress is being made? And, and to your point, it sounded like it was all about accountability. It's one thing to say it, it's another to measure progress against it, and also to, to hold people accountable when they fail to uh, deliver against certain standards. And I, and I think that's more about what progress are you making? And some, it's like many issues, you may have a, a difficult line of business or a, a turnaround situation for your division. And it's, it's not that you're expected to close the gap immediately, but it's how much tangible progress are you making and what strides are you, are you continuing to, to hit, so. You know, what you're highlighting is again, this notion of thinking of this as you would think of another business strategy, like what market are we going to enter? Right. You would design a strategy and operational um, tactics for doing that. You would have measurement systems. You would have course corrections if the measurements weren't operating effectively. You, as I said, make sure your word, reward systems align. So we tried to do that. And, um, and again, I think this is part of a, a process that, that, that companies need to go through. And um, where you're not making uh, the inroads, you, need to, you, you evaluate it just, you, just the way you would with any other strategy. Yeah, hope is not a strategy, or at least <laughs> not a successful one, although many people still reach for it, you know, but... Uh, Apparently. You know, Georgia, I'd be curious to know what advice you might have for, for other CEOs who might be watching this segment mm -hmm. and thinking about, you know, I, I don't know where to start. I don't know, I don't know how to connect my people as strongly to this goal as, as, as I am. And I, I, where do they start? How do they, how do they get this rolling? At, at, at the risk of being repetitive, I, again, I would start by, um, framing this for the organization. You have to be able to articulate this in some way that resonates with folks that know that they have responsibilities to hit certain numbers or to produce a certain amount. And so you have to be able to give context. And so I think framing it for the organization is extremely important. Um, I think this idea of integrating the activities into the company so it becomes embedded as opposed to this idea that it's going to stand alone as a department or a, or a, or a initiative, mm -hmm. right? This has to be built in so that it can be seen as a source of competitive advantage, that it's a business imperative. Um, I think the other thing is to, to recognize that as senior leaders, we are modeling behaviors all the time. And so um, when we have representation in our senior team, it signals to the organization our seriousness. And when we don't, it sometimes signals the opposite. We don't intend necessarily for that to be the signal, but it can inadvertently be that. And I probably am guilty of that at times in my, my career. Um, I think this idea of setting goals and measuring them is important. And then I also think it is valuable to look outside your own organization and, and, to, sort, and to look at what's happening elsewhere and to see where progress is being made and to start to ask the questions like we would in other parts of our, of our um, evolution as leaders. Um, there are lots of places where we can see things happening. It's not necessarily even in the, the private sector. You look at the military and the military has been sort of an early mover on uh, some, some um, growth and, and, and uh, improvement in racial diversity. So I think it is important for us to think of those best practices and look at those. Um, and then design, if possible, um, tools to, to, to get around some of the challenges. Um, those, are, those, those can be hard, and you mentioned earlier, challenging, but things like a diverse slates as a requirement um, is a very good practice. 
Um, blinding applicants is, is sort of something that's been emerging in recent years as, as another tool. Um, you know, I think back in other worlds, there's a reason that if you audition for a symphony, your uh, name may not be uh, clear and you're behind a curtain. And so in a sense, that's a blinding. It, it sort of, it, it, it takes away one of the biases that we can bring to the, to the system. I think I think that's right. I think you have to be willing to look at things and you have to be willing to say this is important enough and we're going to hold each other accountable in whatever that might look like in a particular organization. But um, that, that's a, a great place to start. I, I have a question about, um, you know, I know you serve on several boards and in, in many different organizations. What's the board's role in helping an organization crack the code on this? What advice would you have for board members and what, what should be their role? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I, I do think it's, you know, boards have a responsibility for um, helping uh, define good governments, good governance and, um, and ensuring that it happens, but also in helping to set um, strategy um, with, uh, of course, the leadership of the CEO and, and their team. I think making sure that this becomes part of the strategic conversation um, is, is a good place to start. Um, again, don't allow it to sink too low as a tactical issue or as a departmental issue, or as an initiative, as I mentioned earlier. So I think keeping that um, elevated. I think the second thing is to challenge yourself and to ask the hard questions, including examining your own composition at, as a board. Again, um, even when we attribute positive intent, which I think is true for most people, we can still fall into old patterns. And sometimes you just have to crack, crack, crack the the, the brick a little bit. And I think asking those hard questions, it's a hard one for many of us because it raises this question of sort of racism and is, are we acting in a certain way? And I, I would argue that it doesn't have to be that. It just means that we, as an organization, have fallen into patterns that reinforce certain um, dynamics that have been embedded in the system for a long time. And we have to try to break that cycle. So I think the, the, the board can do that. And again, I think this issue of metrics is always viable for a board. Without question. And I think whenever you can get a board to signal that this is truly important and there'll be accountability, when you get a CEO that leads a team of people who are galvanized around this, and then you have people who begin to see that change is possible and that great things will come from the many lenses you've talked about, uh, then I think you, you start to see an organization with sustainable change. Yeah, I think this is, um, I think what you're describing is exactly right. This is sort of this unique moment, I think, in time. We've had these throughout our history, but I think we, in these moments, it is important for us to sort of take advantage of the energy, um, recognize that while it may make us uncomfortable, a very important issue has been illuminated and it's the opportunity for leadership, both the CEO and, and his or her team, and the board to, to uh, demonstrate leadership. And I think the private sector has this interesting opportunity now to demonstrate that we can, we can lead and, and, um, and in a way set, set, set the path. So um, yeah, I think it's a great, a great opportunity and I think it's, it's one we need to, to, to take advantage of now. No question. And, and I think as business leaders in partnership with human capital leaders have the ability to make significant progress toward equality and equity, fairness, opportunity, just simply by the choices they make across the spectrum of human resource programs and policies. And to your point, by holding folks accountable uh, for, for hitting those goals. So thank you, George. Thank you for sharing your experiences and insights. And thank you for joining me uh, today on this session. It's been, a, it's been a real pleasure. It is my pleasure, Rebecca.